You know, between COVID and the election, you probably haven't heard that this year and this Thanksgiving marks the 400th anniversary of the 1620 voyage from England to the New World, which the Pilgrims aboard a ship called the Mayflower took. This is where they signed the Mayflower Compact. So today, or sometime over this Thanksgiving holiday, I'd like you and your family to watch a documentary that's going to start in just a few moments. This documentary is called Monumental, and it tells the story of the Pilgrims in a way you've probably never heard before. It includes some details you probably never knew. It describes the blueprint that the Pilgrims and their descendants uh, lived by and, and helped to establish, which in time would form the freest and most prosperous nation that has ever existed in the history of the world. You'll also learn about a monument that's located in Plymouth, Massachusetts that I'm pretty sure you've never heard of before, probably never seen pictures of. It was dedicated in 1889 in honor of the ideals that these pilgrims lived by. And as you explore the monument and the writings on the monument, what it does, it provides a roadmap for personal as well as national recovery if our citizens and our nation would just remember it and recommit themselves to it. So I hope you and your family enjoy this presentation of Monumental, and I hope you have a very happy Thanksgiving. set of ideas that is being implemented and advanced in this capital at this time is terribly frightening to people who are students of history. If you look at the 70 superpowers in history, every single one of them has called themselves exceptional. And when you look at the Roman Empire, the parallels to what is going on in America are absolutely frightening. And the question is, are we going to go the right path ourselves, or are we going to continue down the wrong path that so many nations have fallen into? Everybody's telling me the world's going to hell. Economically, we're $14 trillion in debt as a nation. Morally, the family is falling apart. Divorce, teenage pregnancy, teenage suicide, drugs, alcohol. You go down to a local high school, and what was once morally unthinkable, that was shameful, is now not only normal, it's celebrated. Spiritually, we used to be proud of our motto as a country, in God we trust. Now teachers are afraid they're breaking the law if they say that in school. When I look around and I examine the fruit that's hanging on the tree of this country, it's rotting. And when I dig down and examine the root, I find out it's actually worse than I even thought it was. There is something seriously sick in the soul of our country. If you leave a nation long enough, history tells us that eventually there will rise up some kind of a tyrant, some leader who will enslave his people. Why would America be any different? 
And to top it off, I have friends in church that tell me that the worse things get, the better it really is, because it means that the end is near and that Jesus is returning. Don't worry that the world's going to hell in a handbasket, just get out of the handbasket. It's part of the plan, that it's meant to be, that the whole thing is gonna burn. Really? Because I have kids in this world. I have friends who have children in this world and I want a great future for them. And are we supposed to just let it go? But if we just take our hands off the wheel and let it fall off a cliff, aren't we creating a self-fulfilling prophecy? So I turn on the news and find that most people are playing the blame game. The right blames the left, the left blames the right. Government's blaming big business. Business blames big government. Hollywood blames the church and religion. And the church is blaming the media for all of the problems. With everybody blaming everybody else, I'm not hearing a clear voice that's giving us a solution on how to get out of this mess. Wait a minute. It's gotta be simpler than this. Maybe it's as simple as we've forgotten what made this nation so successful and healthy and prosperous and secure in the first place. Maybe if we could go back and talk to the men and women who built this country, they would tell us what we're doing wrong and how to fix it. And if anyone understood what it was like to be in a, in a tough spot as a nation, it was them. I mean, our forefathers came out of an era where they were surrounded by darkness on all sides. I mean, this was a time when you could be hung, burned at the stake, beheaded, or drawn and quartered for disagreeing with the queen or the king. The culture was terrible. Uh, the nation was bankrupt. The king had tripled the debt. People were slaves. And in their church, they had their antichrists and a king who had set himself up as God on earth in the church. So if anyone knew what it was like to live in difficult times where it looked like the end was near, it was them. But what was their attitude? It wasn't put your head down and get ready for the end of the world. It was, we're getting off of the defense, getting on the offense, and we see victory in the future. They had a 500 year plan and they went and built a new nation. Who were these pilgrims? I wanted to learn from them. I wanted to listen to them. And I wanted to find out what made them so unique. So I bought a ticket to England. I went to retrace the escape route of the pilgrims, our forefathers, to understand who they are, why they did what they did, and how we all got to where we are today. And what I discovered blew my mind and changed everything. My journey began in a sleepy little town called Babworth, England. And I met with this amazing woman who was a local historian and a pilgrim expert named Sue Allen. Lovely to meet you. Thank you, you too, I'm Kirk. It was cold, it was gloomy, kind of wet and overcast, and it was, it just, I felt like I stepped into a different world because I'm sitting on a bench and I've got dead people all around me. I've got the tombs and the tombstones of people that had been there since the year 1200. It was funny because as I was talking with her, it almost felt like she was there. I felt like she knew these people, like they were friends of hers, and she just brought them to life. When I think of pilgrims, I think of what I was taught in elementary school and history class. We think of pilgrims coming over in these funny black and white suits with big hats and belt, buckle, <laughs> belt buckles on their shoes and, and uh, turkey guns. No, no, who, no. Who were the pilgrims? Broadly speaking, they were part of the Puritan movement. And to really understand where they're coming from, you need to understand what a Puritan is. Yes. It's for the first time the Bible is printed in English and put into every church because until that point, there were Bibles in English 
being smuggled into the country and they were deemed to be heretical. You could be burned for having an English Bible. And what was the fear of, of having English Bibles in the hands of the people? What would happen if every Tom, Dick and Harry got to read the Bible for themselves and then started to study it for goodness sake and realize that the church in the Bible as Christ had deemed it should be was not this church with bishops in palaces growing rich when the parishioners were starving on the land. People would then hold them accountable. Precisely. And they didn't want that. And as soon as the Bible was in English, that started to happen. For the first time, these people got Bibles in English that they could hold and study in their own hands, in their own homes with their children. Uh, this to them was, was worth more than anything else, even more than their own life, because this was God speaking to them. And it got to a point that by 1593, there was an act against Puritans brought in. And under that law, it became illegal to be a Puritan. Anybody that disagreed with Elizabeth's new church settlement got this name that you could spit out like a curse, Puritan. The state, the queen, the monarch, used the clergy as their mouthpiece to control you. And because of that, you had the government controlling the church and the church controlling the people. And so that's where you have the, the tyranny and the oppression that you can't get away from. And the thought is coming to them. If this church can't be purified, Maybe we should just separate ourselves away from all this unholiness. That's where the word separatist comes from. And that's the dangerous step, because you're stepping away from the church and you're denouncing the monarch in the same breath. That's right. You're not just switching denominations, as we would think of switching churches today. This is tantamount to treason. By leaving the church? Yes. fighting for their survival from that point because they are going against the king. It's no matter just they're going against the church and the king is the head of it. It's treason. So there was my first clue. The separatists were coming out from under the reign of Queen Elizabeth and into the rule of King James. And this guy was a tyrant king on steroids. He's the one who actually invented the phrase, the divine right of kings. He bankrupted his nation, he tripled the debt, and he considered himself to be a devout Christian while he was obsessed with hunting down and destroying the most devout people in his land. One of the things that fascinates me is knowing that once the Bible was translated into English and given to the common man, that changed everything because they started thinking for themselves. They said, this is what the Word of God says. Therefore, church ought to be like what God, God says it should be, not what the king says. And the king himself is a man who is under authority of the king of kings. And he too must abide by the law of God. Once they had come out and shown their true colors, how separatists had no choice but to leave the country or stay and just be slaughtered. And if they were, where was the cause then? For the pilgrims to be able to continue to meet and hold their worship services, they had to do it underground. And there was this castle, um, a manor at a place called Scrooby that was surrounded by a moat for protection. They met this way for four years. For four years, they had to meet in secret. And by candlelight, they would hold their worship services and their Bible studies. They even had their children as lookouts. And then one by one, they would come back to join their parents, their brothers and sisters, and the rest of their church family to worship God.
Every time they opened up a Bible, they had to have been looking over their shoulders, knowing that at any moment the door could burst open and the army comes in and hauls you off to prison, leaving your children and your wife destitute without anything. They knew that it brought them to a place where they had to make a choice. They said, either we're all in and we're going to get caught eventually here, or we're going to make an escape, a strategic retreat out of England where we can continue to grow and develop as a community of faith and one day come back to England to set our friends, family, the church, and the entire nation free from this tyrant. Pilgrims made a secret negotiation with a Dutch sea captain who was to come and pick them up on the shores of England in the middle of the night in his boat and secretly take them across the water to Holland. Our separatists have been walking from Scrooby 60 miles overland. It's September, it's cold. They're camping out, no tents, no sleeping bags. They're not even lighting a fire because the searchers might already be looking for them. Windy, cold, probably wet. When they suddenly see out this very flat landscape, a ship looming out, this ship that's going to take them to freedom. Unfortunately, the sea captain was also double-dealing. He had made another agreement with the local authorities to capture the separatists and hand them over to them. And the deal was, if he would give them the pilgrims, the captain could keep all of their money. Well, the pilgrims had already sold everything that they had up until that point. They, they had no job, they sold their houses, they sold their lands, uh, no money, anything that they had left uh, some of the women had these things hiding under their dresses. So the army comes and captures them, strips them down, takes everything that they have, and throws them into jail. Yeah, th this, was, this was a huge failure. Um, they had this great plan. Now we're gonna get on a boat and go to a new land, but we get caught. Our Bibles are taken away from us. We're thrown into prison. Uh, puts our wives and kids in jeopardy, but they don't stop. They don't see that as a closed door. They see that as just one of the, they see those as battle wounds and scars and lessons that God is teaching them to prepare them for the next mission. What is the rocket fuel that pushes them to say, failure is not final. They're not going, man, this stinks. They're saying, what's next? And they, they plan their next escape. Not out of fear, but with excitement and passion and enthusiasm because they know that God has commissioned them and sent them on an assignment. They planned their next escape and this time it was potentially even more dangerous. The first time they went together on this boat, but the men knew that they were now being watched. So the husbands separated themselves from their wives and children. They hired another sea captain to meet them in the river, to take them to Holland, but they sent their wives and children on ahead by putting them on a little raft and floating them down a stream in hopes of meeting them as they came out of the woods in the middle of the night to, to link back up at the boat, knowing that they may never see them again. 
in this lifetime. I mean, that blows my mind to think of saying to my wife, Chelsea, you're going to be fine. God's going to work this together for our good. James, Jack, Luke, guys, if I don't see you again in this life, you remember everything I taught you. You take care of your mom. You take care of your sisters. These guys were all in. The problem was the women got here a day early and consequently were very seasick. So they came into the shore where it was, you know, less movement. And the problem was they got caught right there on a mud bank. Horrors of horrors. Armed men closing in on the women. The women are helpless. They can't get out of the craft. It's stuck on the mud. They're sitting ducks. The men can't do anything. The women have got all the belongings, all the money. And the captain, when he sees the position, now this was dangerous, because if he was caught, they'd take his ship from him. That's his living. So he cries an oath, Sacramente, and he goes. And once that Dutch ship hit the North Sea, the mother of all storms blew up. And the men were just carried off towards Norway. Two weeks that storm blew. Two weeks. They couldn't control the ship, so they just put themselves below deck and they just had to let it ride out the storm. Mm. It must have been terrifying. Bradford said, you know, for days on end, they didn't see the sun, the moon, the sky, and they really thought they were going to die. And at one point, when they really thought the end was near, our separatists prayed in earnest. They prayed and they said, even now, Lord, even now, you could save us. And the storm abated. They got control of the ship and turned about and made their way to Holland, to Amsterdam, because in that same storm, there were hundreds and hundreds of vessels lost. This one survived to tell the tale. How miraculous is that? Amazing. The story is getting amazing. I mean, here's a, a, a hundred ships get caught up in this storm and don't make it, but the ship with the pilgrims on it makes it. To Holland. They don't have their wives and their kids. They're hoping that they'll meet up with them again. It's not until a, a year later I learned that they actually got their wives and kids over to Holland with them. I couldn't get on a plane and go back to America now. I had to follow this trail. I bought a ticket and got on a ferry and took it across the channel to Holland so that I could see where they set up shop in Leiden and began their church service there under the leadership of their pastor, John Robinson. This one survived to tell the tale. How miraculous is that? Yeah, this is not the story that I heard growing up in school. Um, quiet little religious fuddy-duddies scurry out of England with their tail between their legs and come to America not knowing how to plant corn uh, or fend for themselves. No, they actually planned to go somewhere where they could find spiritual freedom so that they could return to England and set their people free with what they were learning. And Holland was the place for that. Uh, there was a town called Leiden where they regrouped for 12 years as a congregation. In Leiden, I met with one of my good friends and the president of the World History Institute, Dr. Marshall Foster. What was life like for them once they got here? It was tough. 
Uh, they couldn't get jobs because they weren't parts of the guilds. They had to put their children to work many times just to eat and to survive. Then they had to get their wives and children over because the king had kept them behind. And by the time they settled into Leiden in, in uh, 1609, they were, uh, they were barely surviving. But you know what? They were free. And it was the only place they could have gone in all the world that was not under a tyrant who would kill them. If they went to France, tens of thousands were dying. If they would have gone over to uh, Germany, millions were dying in the streets. If they went up to Scotland, 40,000 or more were dying. Even ministers by the thousands were being persecuted and butchered. And so of all the places in the world that they could have gone that year, that was the one place they could be free and they could worship God and they could prepare themselves for the future. Equally important to them was their love of their England that they'd left behind. It was under the divine right tyrant, King James, and they wanted to bring them the liberty of the gospel. And so they set up a printing press in William Brewster's home and that press was the internet of the day. It was the way to go around the censorship of the king and to get the truth of the gospel to the people of England and Scotland. And so they produced over 15 books and then put them in kegs and sent them in ships secretly over to England and Scotland and it went all over the country. Well, James was really excited about that. In fact, he spent the next year and a half tracking this down and finally he found out that it was the Pilgrim Press in Leiden that had published these books. The troops came in, broke down the printing press, and took the seal of the King of England and sealed the home so no one could live there. And that was the end of their adventure in printing. And Bradford tells us, he said, they came to propagate the gospel of Christ, or the kingdom of Christ, to the remotest parts of the world. Yea, they could be but stepping stones for the promotion of so great a work. Now here's a vision. Here's a group of people who are losers. They escape. They now are having to leave. They've got no support. They've got no money. They have all kinds of problems, and yet they're willing to escape to a wilderness, and yet they've got this vision, a generational vision, that they can lay their lives down in this wilderness and literally put their faces down in the mud and have their children walk on their back to a better day. That's a generational perspective. In fact, it was so true of them that at the end of Bradford's life, he says that this one small light that we have kindled here in Plymouth has shined to our entire nation. So it happened. 400 years later, the liberty that the world now enjoys is because these people had the faith to lay their lives down in the wilderness 400 years ago. They had to put their children to work many times just to eat. They were barely surviving. Troops came in, broke down the printing press. They came to propagate the gospel of Christ to the remotest parts of the world. So they don't go from Holland to America. They go from Holland back to England, back into the lion's den. And that's where they hire two ships, the Mayflower, but also the Speedwell. And that's the two ships that were going to take these 150 passengers across the ocean to the New World. A little while into their trip, the Speedwell sprung a leak. It, it wasn't speedy and it wasn't well. It cracked and they had to pull back into shore. Another opportunity for them to get caught and imprisoned or killed. So think of all the doors that have slammed on them up to this point. Right? They're meeting in secret. They escape for the first time. They get caught, thrown into prison. They escape a second time, get separated from their wives and children. They try to make it in Holland. That's not working out. So they get on a ship, go back to England. The first ship springs a leak. They've got to go back again. At what point do you say, enough? We get it. This is not part of the plan.
And then there wasn't enough room for all of the passengers on the remaining Mayflower. They hold a meeting and they realize that this family of pilgrims that had been together for 12 years under the loving leadership of their pastor, John Robinson, and they decide that half of them will continue the trip and half of them will stay. Can you imagine what, what it would have felt like for this pastor who had poured his life into these people and taught them everything he knew? He told them the stories of all of the heroes of freedom and liberty that had come before them, starting with Moses, leading the the children of Israel out of the wilderness into the promised land and starting a brand new nation under God's laws, electing leaders for themselves, men of character, and submitting themselves to the laws and principles that were right and true in the eyes of God. Now, Pastor Robinson would have to stay behind knowing that he would most likely never see half of his family ever again, trusting that what he had taught them, the seeds that he had planted in their hearts and their mind would bear fruit in a land that he would never visit for the sake of their children and their grandchildren while he stayed behind and helped those who were trying to survive in Holland. That's a different kind of Christian Someone who plants seeds today, not for their own benefit, but to provide opportunity and blessing and prosperity for their children and their children's children. And they're willing to sacrifice everything now in order to give that gift to them. Because they know that they can ultimately stand on the promises of God and be victorious. They come together, they pour everything into this, just like they did when they left England. They sold everything they had, and they had to even go in debt to get this ship, just to hire it. It's called the Mayflower. It's a, it's a former wine ship. It, it had never crossed the Atlantic. Very few ships had ever crossed the Atlantic. In fact, it was just to go around the ports of England delivering wine. And this time, they've got 102 passengers. They've got about 30 crew members, and they take off late. I mean, nobody travels in September, October, November, on the North Atlantic in the 16th century. You're crazy, but they did. And as they took off in the fall of 1620, not knowing that their three-week journey was going to be a eight-week journey that was gonna take 66 days. So what, what was it like on the boat? Uh, well, if you can imagine constant gales in the North Atlantic on a little boat like this, and having a boat with with no, nothing to protect the water from going down underneath. So in that one deck that is below the main upper deck, you basically have it four, four and a half feet high. You've got 102 people crammed in there. They're going back and forth at a 45 degree angle. They're all huddled together. Water is pouring down on their head. So they're constantly wet. They're barfing. Their children are barfing. They've got constant sickness and disease. They've got everybody going to the bathroom and trying to hide the smell. I mean, it, it must have been horrendous. They had no idea where they were. The ship was almost out of control. They find themselves with a ship that is now breaking. The main beam that holds the whole ship together, which goes horizontal, has now cracked and is coming down and the water's pouring in. At that point, the captain comes down and said, well, prepare to meet your God, this is it. And the pilgrims had brought, providentially, a giant screw, which was, it, one of those screws probably that holds the bottom of a house together when you're lifting it up. And so they pushed it just right into place at the right place, put a log underneath it, twisted it in and saved the main beam, which of course saved the ship, which saved them from disaster. What kind of person you have to be, what kind of father you have to be to look your wife and your kids in the eyes and say, we're gonna get on this kind of a boat. I know it's never crossed the Atlantic, 
uh, I know this doesn't look possible, but we're gonna go because, because it's worth it. I mean, what, what kind of character do you have to have to do something like that with your family? I mean, you're either crazy or you've got courage and you've got faith. These are the real people that founded America and they were real. Were they perfect? No. Did they cry out and scream, I'm sure, in fear? Did they, uh, were they afraid? Yes, they were, but, but they carried on and persevered. In fact, William Bradford, their governor said, if we are to lose our lives in this endeavor, at least we know that our cause is just and our cause is honorable. So their perspective was do the right thing over the long haul and in the long run, God will bless it. This could have been the most tragic mistake that they had ever made. But they didn't believe that. They continued to believe that God was with them, that the wind of providence was behind their back, and that nothing happens by accident. But because of this desperate situation, with no civil order to speak of, to walk into, they had to create a system by which they could all get along so that they didn't kill each other. Because remember, you had not only the pilgrims on the ship, you had other crew members, you had businessmen, and everyone had competing ideas and agendas. And so they had to draft up something of an agreement that says, guys, we need to help each other. We need to clearly set out who we are and why we are here and agree on some rules that we're going to live by. And they made that covenant with God and with one another in a document that is now known as the Mayflower Compact. And they did this while they were still on the boat. So I met with Dr. Paul Jaley, the president of the Plymouth Rock Foundation, to help me understand the real significance of the Mayflower Compact. Act. They come into agreement, saint and stranger, those from the Church of England, those from the Separatists, they join together in a civil body politic, which is, of course, larger than any one church. It's gonna to have to serve everyone. This was an act of self-government. This was not an act from somebody else telling you who your government was. In fact, they had this phrase, this would be as sure as any patent. In fact, maybe even more sure. In other words, because we did it from our own hearts, right. and you think about it this way, if you have a say in the laws, are you gonna be more apt to be submissive to it? Sure, of course. Sure. And you, you can voluntarily consent. So that's why, that's why I would think Bradford probably meant, look, it's gonna be even more sure than a patent when we do it ourselves. Right, and because it's coming out of the convictions of our own heart exactly. and everyone gets a say in this. It's not just the king and the top down. Exactly. I mean, think about it. Everything that America would become famous for and would make it unique among any other nation in the world was planted into the hearts and minds of those pilgrims by their pastor, John Robinson. Here you had the seeds of the richest, freest, most prosperous nation floating in the belly of this boat, crossing the Atlantic, ready to be planted in this virgin soil for the birth of the United States of America. Unbelievable. This is the uh, memorial stone erected by Massachusetts honoring the fact that the pilgrims signed that Mayflower Compact on board the ship. On the reverse is the actual text of the compact. Come over and see it. What just stands out in this whole thing to me is right in the beginning where it says, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith. This is why we came. That's right. For the glory of God sure. and the advancement of the Christian and faith. And this is a government civil charter that they're signing. They understood that throughout history, God has always used a small group of people who were totally committed and all in. And they knew that if they kept their covenant with God and with one another, God would be faithful. This was the great experiment. The stakes were high and they had everything to lose if it didn't work. But finding Plymouth 
was just the beginning because now their work really began. They had no place. They, there's no place to sleep, no sleeping bag. Imagine two or three feet of snow on the ground in November, December, January. Fortunately, the captain stayed behind. He was going to leave them, but he realized that if he left them, they were goners. So he stayed behind a mile offshore, and the women and children would go out every night and sleep on the Mayflower. The men would stay just sleeping on the ground until they could build some form of shelter both from the elements and also from what they thought were hostile Native Americans who could take them down any time. But as the winter went on, it got harder and harder. They got so sick that at one time, only six or seven could walk. And you've got 102 people sick, lying either inside this little fort that they're trying to build or on the Mayflower, and six or seven are changing their clothes. They're dying, they're vomiting, they're changing and, and trying to keep them warm. In the midst of that, those six or seven had to carry them up on the hill, and they would then bury them in a common grave. Why? Because they were afraid that the Native Americans would see how weak they are if they put headstones and buried them individually. They'd realize one by two, 30, 40, 50 people dying. So by the end of winter, within three months, 47 of 102 of them are dead. But the women were getting sick and dying, and they were sleeping on their children to keep them warm. So by the end of the winter, most of the women had died. Most of the children survived. They get to the end of the winter, the end of March. What would you do? You know that you're, you can barely walk. Half of you are dead. The only hope you have of surviving is going to take off right now. And the captain comes and pleads with you one more time. Get on the boat. We can be in England in a few weeks. Not one of them went back. Every one of them stayed, believing that they had come for a great cause and purpose and that if they were to die in the wilderness, they would die in the wilderness. And they stayed. Forty-seven of 102 of them are dead. They were sleeping on their children to keep them warm. So by the end of the winter, most of the women had died. Most of the children survived. through my mind was what I learned in school. Uh, didn't the white man come over from Europe and abuse the Indians? Didn't white man simply steal their land and ultimately throw them on reservations? Wasn't this a bad thing? Well, what I learned is, yes, that was happening. And there was abuse going on uh, both directions. You had conquistadors and you had these uh, opportunistic businessmen who were coming over and would stop at nothing to rape and pillage the land in order to get what they wanted for themselves. But the pilgrims were not part of that. They were totally different. Remember, the pilgrims came across the Atlantic with their wives and their children. They came as families. They weren't looking for a fight. They weren't looking to rape and steal. They came to start a new life and to bring blessing to this land and eventually to the whole world. Now, the pilgrims' relationship with the natives was not perfect. Uh, some things went wrong. But what stands out is the character of these people. At a time when most people in the world viewed the Native Americans as animals, the pilgrims treated them as equals. There is one story that Bradford tells us in his journal of the pilgrims executing one of their own people based on the testimony of two Native American witnesses. Who, who does that? Where do you get that from? That is a system of all men are created equal under the law.
nothing like bones to remind you of your heritage. That's why I like bringing people up here, because it reminds us of our own mortality, it reminds us that we are in a relay race. We're in a generational relay race. And they understood that. This is William Bradford's grave. That's him. He's the governor for 30 years of the Pilgrim Colony, who lost his wife the first winter, who fell off the back of the Mayflower. She was the first one to die. He's one of those that survived the first winter. He's one that went on and became their governor and their faithful leader for all this time. And this is, they built this for him many years later. But they did put a Hebrew inscription that says, Jehovah is our help. That's from him, because he himself taught himself Hebrew to be closer to Moses, closer to the Old Testament so he could be closer to God. They had a love for God and a love for their families and a love for freedom that brought them to this world. And, 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 and William Bradford exemplifies that. I wish, I wish they had left us some kind of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a training manual, some kind of a, a secret sauce recipe card that we could pick up and go, all right, here's what it is, here's what we do. What do we do? How do we get back to that? You now, when uh, the children of Israel are going into the Promised Land, they crossed the Jordan River, and God stood it on end, and they walked across. And before the waters stopped parting, God told them to take 12 stones from the bottom of the river and put it up on the top of Mount Gilgal and make a monument, so that when your children ask, what are these stones, they will be able, you will be able to tell them, this is where God parted the sea. And that's what the pilgrims left us. They left us a monument that not only gives tribute to what was accomplished here, but it gives us a specific strategy, a breakout of a blueprint of if we would ever forget what made America great, what made us free, we can go back and follow that strategy and it's right up on a hill a half mile from here. Right here? Right here. It's 180 tons of solid granite. It's the largest granite monument in America, and it's hidden on a hilltop overlooking Plymouth in a residential neighborhood. I've never heard of this. Hardly anybody in America knows about it, and yet the people of America put this together over a 70-year period, paid for by the Congress, paid for by the state legislature in Massachusetts, as a strategy laid out, we call it the Matrix of Liberty, that was given to us by the forefathers, by the pilgrims. And they, those 130 years ago, when they built this, wanted to leave this behind for us. So that if we would ever forget how liberty is built, we would know what to do to regain it. This is how they did it. This is how they did it. Now, if, if somebody else wants to try another way, which is what's happening today in America, we're trying a thousand ways to turn America around, but this is the way it was done. Look. This is it, the only successful strategy of liberty that has ever been carried out in the history of mankind. Well, let's walk through it. And yeah, this, yeah, we're, let's we're, take this strategy apart. What does this mean? What are they trying to tell us here? So where do you, where do you well, start? Well, her name is Faith. It says so right there. And she is pointing her finger to heaven. Why? For God is. For God is, because her faith is in the God of the Bible in Jesus Christ. They knew that the only faith that could bring true liberty was a faith in the one true God and his Bible. And you see a Bible there, an open Bible. It's a Geneva Bible. The pages are opened up, which meant that they read it. And as they read it, and as they had faith in God, he gave them wisdom. That's why you see the star on her forehead. She's given wisdom to know how to live in this world. And all of the rest of these statues, each one weighing almost 20 tons, is tied to faith, because without faith, it falls apart. And that's the beginning of it all. 
where do we go from there? From, from here, you need to go to character or morality, and you'll notice... Because that's the internal liberty. That is the internal liberty, which is the beginning of all freedom. She is called morality. Notice that she has no eyes. That is on purpose because she's looking internal, internal character, the transformation of the heart first, and then that brings external transformation. And notice that she has the Ten Commandments in her left hand and the scroll of Revelation in the right. What would that signify? The Bible. Exactly. That if you want to have morality, there has to be a standard. And more than that, there has to be an internal transformation. This is speaking of the need to internalize and allow God to change our hearts and our minds first. Because from in, Eng in England, you had top-down morality imposed on people. Do this, do that. You're moralizing people, but you're saying their morality started in the heart. In the heart. It had to be changed here. They realized Inside. just because you said you were a member of a church, like the Church of England, didn't make you a Christian. And you see this over on the side. The side statues give an explanation of what the meaning of this is for us. That's why we need the evangelist. You see the evangel here writing down the gospels. And there's a need for evangelists. Why? Because we need to have the gospel, the gospel of the great liberating gospel of Christ that says he came to set us free first. So this is completely contrary to the way the rest of the world had done it up to this point. The, the, the pilgrims are saying that morality starts internally with the gospel. The evangelist has to preach the message that transforms the heart, and then you want to do what's right, rather than being forced to do what's right from the king who tells you what good and bad is. That's it. Okay, what's next? What's next is, and you see the development of it, if you want to have a free civilization, you need to have a civil authority or civil law that will give a base for that freedom. In other words, You've, you've got to have some degree of order in society. And that order, as you see here, is built upon law. The principles of God's law then are related into the civil law. And that's what we see here in, in his left hand. We also see his hand, his right hand is extended in mercy. Mercy toward those that, that he's dealing justice with. Why? Because this form of law has a degree of equity in it. And you see this in the side statues where it's- Can we go see Yeah, it? yeah. Justice. She's holding the scales of justice with justice and equity, which, which means that you know when a crime is committed, it should be uh, cared for in terms of its punishment, the same for the rich and for the poor and for everyone else. There should be equality under the law. On the other side, we notice that this form of law is different than the laws of so many nations that are built on tyrants, that are built on, if the Aztecs wanted to cut your heart out, they just cut your heart out. Here, mercy. Mercy built upon the base that he offers us, mercy and grace, uh, along with law. And in this form of law, there is that uh, tremendous mercy. So you have to start with faith. Faith in the true God that produces the internal morality of the heart. You have a standard by which to uh, to judge what good and bad is, and then you create a moral system of law to have a basis for a free and just society that can mete out justice when crimes are committed, but also extend mercy to people and, and show them grace. And then that gives you the freedom. Once you have a society that's built like this, now you have a civility in society. Now you can educate your children. Here, they could train them. And you see the lady here in the statue of education, and she is opening the Word of God or the Book of Knowledge, and she has got the wreath of victory. She's wearing about a 25-year-old woman. She is educating her children, and she is sitting in victory. Why is she sitting in victory? Because she has trained her children up in the way they should go and prepared them so that the next generation that came after them would know the strategy of how to carry on the truth and carry on a free civilization. Isn't that amazing? And, and what's on her side over here? Over here, you see her training her child. And she has uh, a book in her one hand, and then he has a scroll where he is writing on the other. And this is youth, trained in their youth. It was the parents' responsibility to educate. 
And so this would be the mother training up a child in the way he should go. You know, what I think is interesting is that they had just left England and left this, this top-down government system. So when they got here, their idea of education wasn't send your kids off to a, a, a government school to educate them. Uh, it was the parents' responsibility to do this, particularly because their worldview was different than the government's worldview, which would have been, no, you're a nobody, you're a slave, you just lay down on your back and do whatever the king says, which is sort of the attitude that we get in most governments today, is that you just do whatever the government says, whereas they're saying, no, it's our responsibility as parents to educate our kids and to teach them faith and internal, internal morality and to understand the importance of fair, just, and merciful laws. And it's passed down from generation to generation. And if you see on the other side, you'll see how the grandfathers played a role. For it's not just the father. Of course, the father and the mother are the key educators. But the key is the hoary heads. Those are the older ones who also have a role. Because you see the guy with the beard here. He's the old guy. And what do you see his left hand pointing to? Uh, there's a book, and it looks like you've got the Ten Commandments again. Ten Commandments and an open Bible, OK? And so he. Being older and wiser, he knows the commandments, he knows the word of God, and then he is pointing to that, and then on the other side, what do you see of him? That's the world. The world, right. So he is teaching the younger generation, both the, his daughter and his grandchildren, how the world works from a biblical perspective. And all of this leads to something, Kirk, and that's, you see the strategy building from the internal to the external, to the law, to education, to pass it on to the next generation. And what are they passing on? They're passing on liberty. And this is what is the result of living out that strategy. In his name, his name is Liberty. We call him Liberty Man. Look at this guy, he's a, a liberty stud. hero. Now this guy is not a guy you want to mess with, right? And he's, uh, he's seated in liberty. Okay, explain who this guy is. Liberty man. Liberty man, oh, the liberty hero that he represents, is the fruit, he is the result of obeying the matrix of liberty that you see on this monument. And he is seated in liberty. Now I want you to be careful to notice these details. Notice that he's holding broken chains in his left hand. Notice that he has where the chains were bound to his legs. Notice that, that he is now seated in liberty. He's got that good look on his face like, listen, I'm free, but I'm looking out defending my liberty, but I'm free. And notice the claw that is on his right shoulder. That claw relates to a skin that goes around to the left here, and you see a lion's head an entire lion skin. That ultimately re represented the lion of the English tyrant back in those days. So he, so he has slain the lion. He's slain the lion, and that's what it says here on the left. Tyranny is defeated, and you see Liberty Man standing over tyranny with his foot on the chest of tyranny. He's holding tyranny down. And again, the pilgrims won this victory without e violence of any kind, except living out God's principles. You know, one of the things that's striking me is the fact that this is talking about our forefathers, the pilgrims, but this guy is not some wimpish little religious guy. I mean, this guy is a stud, right? Yeah. He, he's strong, he's yeah. looking out, he has just defeated a beast, and he's got a sword in his hand. That's right. And he's here to protect, right? That's right. He's here to protect his family and to defend the, the, the laws that they have made and ultimately to defend their values and their character, their faith. Exactly, exactly. And it shows you that if you do it right, you can be strong as an individual, you can defend liberty, and if need be, you can fight. You don't wanna fight, but if you have to, you're ready. But the point is, because you've done it God's way, there is a long-term blessing that goes with it. This is awesome. This is it. <laughs> this is it. So Kirk, this is that recipe. This is that, that strategy, that matrix, that was what built America. This is it. And if we want to try something else, yeah, people can try other things. But in the history of the world, the one strategy that has brought more liberty, more prosperity, 
and more joy than any other is this strategy. Why would you go anywhere else? But those were the forefathers. What about the founding fathers? 150 years later, the George Washingtons, the Thomas Jeffersons, Benjamin Franklin, Madison, John Adams, the people that framed the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, the real beginnings of the United States of America. In that 150 years, did they lose that deep faith of our forefathers? Were they really a bunch of atheists, agnostics, and deists, like modern historians tell us? I, I needed to find that out. for original source documents during the founding era. David Barton has the largest private collection of Bibles and documents and textbooks from early America. I wanted to, I wanted to see John Hancock's John Hancock for myself. What are these? This is a family Bible done in 1798. This Bible was funded by about a dozen signers of the Constitution and signers of the Declaration, as well as by President John Adams and Vice President Thomas Jefferson. They're the guys who put up the financial backing to do this Bible. Funded by signers of the Declaration. And the Constitution. Yeah. And the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gunning Bedford, signer of the Constitution. John Dixon, signer of the Constitution. Uh, you had so many of the signers who, who were part of this. Alexander Hamilton helped, helped fund this Bible. Because they wanted families together. They wanted the, the Word Bible. of God out to every family because they believe that would make for a better country. Makes for a better country, makes for a better faith. And, and again, this is a product of our atheist, agnostic, deist founding fathers, or at least we're told that's who they are today. When you see this stuff, you go, wait a minute, these guys, why would any atheist, agnostic, or deist promote the Word of God, fund it, and want it distributed to every family and everyone in America? Why, why would they fund a Bible that you can take and give out to your neighbors to evangelize them? Doesn't make sense if they're atheist, agnostic, deist. Now, on the other hand, if these guys happen to be Christians, this makes a lot of sense. This is one of the rarest books in the world. This little book right here, really delicate. It's done in 1782. This is the first Bible ever printed in English in America. They printed 10,000 of them. There's 22 left in private hands. This is one of them. So one of the rarest books in the world. What's cool, is this Bible, the Bible of the Revolution, was printed by the Congress of the United States. So Congress printed the first English language Bible. They said in Congress that this Bible is, quote, a neat edition of the Holy Scriptures for the use of our schools, end quote. So the founding fathers in Congress printed the first Bible in English and they did it for the use of schools? I didn't think they wanted the Bible in schools. It's what we hear, it's what we've been told. The Bible was put in schools back in 1647, first public school law. We kept it in schools till 1963 when the court said, yeah, we've done it 320 years, let's do something different. And now we're told the founding fathers never wanted the Bible in schools. That one piece of history right there proves exactly opposite. Real simple. So, so hold on. The United States Congress was commissioning and printing Bibles to be given to all the people because they knew that that's what would produce the character necessary to make America blossom and flourish and thrive. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson understood that without Christianity, you have no basis for a free and just nation. And that's why they promoted the principles of Christianity, even if they were not themselves personal, genuine followers of Jesus Christ. The, these arguments that, that we're hearing that, oh, these, they, you know, uh, Christianity was not uh, a significant part of their lives. If anything, they were deists. They're just simply, th those arguments are simply based on ignorance or, or, uh, deliberate, or deliberate de denying it. Yeah, I anybody who knows history knows it's a deliberate attempt. Now, I believe there's a lot of people who repeat this ignorantly because they simply teach right. what they were taught in they, school. 
They got this in school. But there was a generation that absolutely got this wrong. No question about it. And they did it deliberately. Now, this is a book done by two professors, Kramnik and Moore. This, these are Cornell University professors. It's a book called The Godless Constitution. These guys, they, they assert founding fathers were all atheists, agnostics, deists, and that's why they gave us a godless document, because they themselves were godless. So they go through and lay it. Now, I find this used as a textbook in universities all over the country. You know, they, they go through and lay out their whole case. And I mean, you see the letters we just pulled and documents we got everywhere around here. And you go, what's the documentation for this thing that none of the founders believed in God, that, that they had a secular government, a godless constitution? And so you look the at the footnotes. Yeah, you go to the bibliography at the back. And you get back here to the end, and, and it talks about a note on sources. Now, now we're looking at footnote sources. This is going to be cool. And when you get here, look what these two professors say. We have dispensed with the usual scholarly apparatus of footnotes. We're not documenting a single thing. Everybody trusts us, we're PhDs. We're telling you all these guys are atheist agnostic. Do you think there's any kid going to university in America today who could write a thesis paper and not footnote it and have a professor not tear their head off? And yet we got two professors saying, oh no, it's a godless constitution. They're all godless. Now, we don't have to footnote anything. We've dispensed with that usual stuff because everybody knows they're godless. This is pure revisionism. This is the kind of stuff where it's deliberate. You got to work really hard. And the reason they couldn't document it is you're not going to find original documents like that. You can find maybe two or three documents out of 100,000 maybe. That's the best they can come up with. And that's just, again, the exception, not the rule. And that's the way we teach history today. We say, well, founders were all slave owners because Jefferson owes slaves. Well, that's one of the 56 signers of the deck. How about the 70% of the signers of the deck that were abolitionists and formed the first abolition societies? Well, the founders were all atheist agnostics. This goes Jefferson and Franklin. Well, how about the other 54? How about the fact that of the 56 signers of the Declaration, 29 of those guys held seminary degrees? More than half the signers were seminary. We never talk about that. And that's what these guys do. They may find a, a piece or two here. They don't even footnote it. But they may find a piece or two to prove their case. Every piece they find, we can find 50, 70, 100, 200, exactly the opposite. But this is what kids get in college now. Wow. I mean, these documents that I held in my hands proved to me that our founding fathers did not lose that deep faith in God. They didn't ditch the strategy of the pilgrims. In fact, they were following it. Congress was printing Bibles and they were paying to send them into homes and churches and schools. to go a little bit deeper into the history of our educational system. So I met with Professor Herb Titus, who graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School, was the dean of two law schools, and is a constitutional scholar. He wanted to show me some little known facts about the university to help bring all of this into focus. Coming up here to the uh, main gate into the Harvard Yard, right? and uh, you might look at this plaque here. After God had carried us safe to New England, and we had built our houses, provided necessaries, ne necess necess necessary. necessaries yeah. for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government. Now let's look at that for a minute. We oftentimes hear about separation of church and state, as if the church has to be isolated from the affairs of the civil government. This says just the opposite. It says that if you're going to have a civil government that has justice and law, it has to be based upon a moral foundation which comes from the church. At Harvard University, it says this, on the wall. That's right. And it's, it's behind a tree and a fire hydrant. <laughs> you know, what, what does that say? As a matter of fact, the motto of Harvard in the beginning was Christ and the church. Christ and the church. Christ and the church. And then later it was Christ and the church and truth. Do you know what the motto is today? 
What is it? Truth. Without Christ in the church. Look right up here. You can see it there on this seal. See that top there? Can you read that? Yeah. Christo et ecclesiae. Yeah, Christ and the church. Now notice where it's located. At the top. At the top. Because underneath that is veritas, which is the Latin word for truth. Now notice, without the headship of Christ and the church, how can you know truth? This is on the gates of Harvard. That's right. And the problem is, is that 200 years after the founding of Harvard, they had a president by the name of Charles William Eliot, and he changed Harvard's motto, taking Christ and the church off and leaving only Veritas. When we ignore the inscriptions over the gates of Harvard and over the entrance to the, the Langdale School of Law, what happens to a nation? A nation that attempts to build a foundation on something other than God's law ultimately will self-destruct because you can't live according to the law as man invents it to be. The remnant of God's law continues in America simply because you can't live by any other rules than by God's rules. And you can't discard those rules. For example, we hold people responsible for murder, for theft, even though the dominant view of who man is, is evolutionary. We're only determined by our genes and our environment, and the reason that some people do things that they do is because it's inevitable, it's determined. Yet we can't live that way, because we live in God's world, not the evolutionary world of Darwin's imagination, but God's reality. It just makes so much sense. We live in God's world, and his world operates according to certain universal principles, like the law of gravity, the law of inertia, and morality. All these things are in motion, and they cannot be changed. You don't break God's laws. God's laws break you. We can violate them, but we do that to our own hurt. God does not allow false principles and false laws to produce lasting success. It's kind of like the law of gravity. A guy can jump off the building and say, I win, this is great. The problem is his thrill is only temporary. It's not lasting. Eventually, that law will break him. And it's the exact same with morality, economics, politics, everything. And it's not just applying to America, it's for China, for Africa, Europe, Australia. They're just built into the universe and our founders understood that, and they knew where to find those eternal principles. The founders had a clear sense that there were three tasks to establishing a free society. You had to win it, you had to order it, and you had to sustain it. Now, of course, that's the present generation's task because that's the work of centuries, not just a few years. We cannot put our confidence in just pure democracy to make sure everything is gonna keep running the way it is. You have to remember Hitler was elected with a great majority of German votes. Pure democracy was, was not viewed with anything other than skepticism by the founders. They understood that freedom starts at the grassroots level, at the individual citizen building families of righteous new patriots and citizens. That's what makes it work. This is a new nation when we think about history and world history. And this country was allowed to emerge and become what it is because of the grace of God. And those who founded this nation understood that. And that's why, you know, America hasn't been destroyed like other nations that have fallen because there are still people here who call on the name of the Lord.
There's an old Christian hymn that says, this is my father's world, and I'm absolutely convinced of that. And we need to be more sensitive to the movement of God in our history because it gives us reasons for optimism. You know, a lot of times we feel very, very pessimistic, but when we see how God has already moved in the past, why would we fear for the future? People say you can't turn the clock back. Culturally, you can. Both the Reformation and the Renaissance were movements that went back, and they actually went forward by going back. And that's where America is today. There is nothing in today's America that cannot be solved by a genuine going back to the American first principles. You know, here's a very important lesson we can learn throughout history. You know, if we want to go and transform America, the nations, we have to bring liberty to man. Liberty is the key component to what is necessary to bring prosperity and justice and, and, and you know, for all individuals. A nation is cultivated not in relation to the number of natural resources it possesses, but in the relation to the amount of liberty it possesses. This is why America became the most free and prosperous nation ever in history, because it was the most free nation. Liberty produces prosperity, but that's not the whole equation. Where does liberty come from? Well, the founders of America recognized that Christianity produces liberty, but it's the source of civil liberty and economic liberty because it gives the ideas, it gives the industry, the character, the worldview. I can be creative like my God. I'll labor hard and, and create things. It gives the, it is the source of what produces that liberty, which then leads to prosperity and justice and virtue. This is the story of America. Christianity came and produced the most free nation that we've ever seen. That liberty was the, the framework that people could then labor, benefit from the fruit of their labor, get ideas, be creative. They were honest and in, uh, industrious, and so they, they were able to, the free flow of ideas were able to come forth. This is why there's no nation like America. This is what has made America exceptional. And there's quote after quote from our founders that recognize Christianity and its truth, obeying those precepts and allowing God to infuse the, you know, the power of the Spirit in our heart to live that way, that is what has been the source of American exceptionalism. That means anybody can affect change within a nation. That's good news. That's very good news. <laughs> I'm looking for good news. Yeah. My questions were answered on this journey. I've learned that the solution to the crisis we're in as a nation, economically, morally, and spiritually, is not to blame someone else. The responsibility to secure freedom for my family lies in my hands. For 400 years, we've had the strategy. We've got the game plan. And it's produced a nation that is healthy and strong and free. And every time we've strayed from it, we've suffered the consequences. The seed that grew this nation was faith in God. That faith produces character, a character that produces great courage, courage to self-govern, courage to guide and educate our children in the right worldview, and the courage to elect today's liberty men and women who will take the torch from our forefathers. The answer doesn't begin at the White House. It begins at your house. I'm no longer gonna sit on the sidelines and do nothing. I'm gonna get involved. And I know there are millions who feel like I do. As for me and my family, we're going this way. The way of our heroes who fought against all odds and changed the world. The time is now. Join me, and together, we will secure a monumental future for our children. <laughs>